So it's an honor to be here at this great university. I'm here to talk to you for two lectures about cosmic and biological evolution. Uh, please feel free to stop me if I'm going too fast or too slow, or if you have any questions. I want to convey to you over the course of these two lectures two ideas. The first is that the science that we're about to talk about is very exciting. It's not something that's written in textbooks with formulas you need to memorize. Rather, it's something that's changing every day. That's the first message I want to convey to you. In order to convey that message, I want to show you a short video about a discovery that took place last month, just six weeks ago. It was the most amazing discovery of my lifetime in my field. And I want to share with you how exciting it is. Now, you may not be able to understand all of the words here because the microphones don't work that well, and also they're using a little bit of jargon, but watch the people's faces as um, one of the founders of a theory called inflation, which is at the heart of our story, finds out that his theory was confirmed. Please, just for this one part, be very quiet because the microphones are going to struggle to pick this up. Stanford University. Today I'm going to deliver a news to Professor Andre Linde, who is the founding father of inflation. So inflation is the theory about the bang of Big Bang. It explains why we have all this stuff in the universe. So today I'm going to tell him our experiment, BICEP2, based at South Pole, has found the smoking gun evidence of inflation. He has no idea that I'm coming. Why? So I have a surprise for you. Wow. It's five that? sigma at point two. Discovery? Yes. What? <laughs> Just a second. Can, 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 can you repeat it? Five sigma, as clear as day, are at point two. Can you repeat it again? Are point two plus or minus point, point two? Five. If you stop there. <laughs> <laughs> we don't expect anybody, Renata tells it's probably some kind of delivery. Did you order anything? <laughs> yeah, I ordered it 30 years ago. <laughs> Finally, it arrived. Cheers, cheers. Congratulations. 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 Oh my God, I'm, I'm going, going to break your life on this. <laughs> we are talking right now about the billions of a billions of a billions of a millions of a second after the Big Bang. So we see the face of the Big Bang. It is an image of these gravitational waves, which are purely quantum gravity feature uh, of what was produced in the quantum Big Bang. Gravity. So mm -hmm. this is a remaining part of the story. It's really oh, hard. They to... all there. They all They're three all there. different experiments. Yes. If this is true, this is a moment of understanding of nature of such a magnitude that it just overwhelms. Uh, and let's see, let, let, let's just hope that it's not a trick. I always live with this feeling, uh, what if I am tricked? What, what if uh, I, I believe into this just because it is beautiful? What if, uh, yes, so this is, really helpful <laughs> to have events like that. It's really, really helpful. Thank you so much for yeah, doing it. Yeah. So that, I hope, addresses the first claim that this is the kind of field where 70-year-old men and women begin crying when they hear results. It's that exciting. The second point, so you already understand the first point and we're only four minutes into the lecture. The second point is that we have a handle for the first time on a question that people have been asking for thousands of years. How did we get here? So over the next, over today and Wednesday, I'd like to share with you the way that we are asking that question and that way we, the way we are beginning to answer it. So the question is how did we get here we're going to spend a little bit of time developing and trying to understand what that question means. So we, we live on Earth. I flew about, um, about 
10,000 kilometers to get here. That's about the size of the, of the Earth, just to give a sense of scale. You don't have to remember any of these numbers, but just to give you a sense of, of what things are. So that's one thing we have to understand is how the Earth got here. The Earth, though, is, um, is but one planet that is revolving around the sun. There, how many planets are there revolving around the sun? Good, about eight, I'd say that's about right. And so there are about eight planets revolving around the sun. And if you think about the scale of things, the, um, the Earth is about 10,000 kilometers. The solar system is four billion kilometers. So it's much, much, much larger than the Earth. So if we're gonna understand how we got here, we have to understand not just this thing, but we have to understand something the size of four billion kilometers. In fact, the distance is so large that it's sometimes useful to, to express it in a different unit. In America, we use miles. Here, you, I think you use kilometers, right? You use kilometers. Astronomers often use a different measure, which is the fact, which uh, exploits the fact that light can travel at a finite speed. So the distance that light can travel in, say, an hour is called a light hour. Four billion kilometers is four light hours. That means it takes light four hours to travel from one end of the solar system to the other end. So that gives another way of measuring distance, light hours or light years. So we have to understand the Earth in the context of the solar system. But actually, the solar system, the star that our planets revolve around, is but one of many, how many in our galaxy? Does anyone know? How many stars in our galaxy? Any guesses? Sorry? Great, perfect. About 100 billion stars in our galaxy. So um, we're just one of 100 billion. We're sitting right there. But in principle, we should try to account for the full structure in our galaxy which is 100 billion stars. And by the way, each of those stars probably has at least one planet going around it. So we want to try to understand that. And the scope of that, the scope of the galaxy, is unimaginably large, so much so that we no longer speak in kilometers. We speak not in light hours, but in light years. And it takes light about 50,000 years to traverse one end of the galaxy to the other end of the galaxy. Again, don't worry about the numbers, but just get a sense of the scale of how large the galaxy is. In fact, that's not quite the end, because in addition to our galaxy, there are other galaxies. Any idea how many galaxies we've seen so far? Guess. A hundred? A thousand? A million? We've seen about a billion galaxies so far. So we've seen a billion galaxies. Each one of those galaxies has 100 billion stars and planets. The distances are incomprehensible, billions of light years across. That's how far we've seen now. If we want to answer the question, how did we get here, we want to try to understand this vast range of phenomena. And we want to go further, starting in the other direction, on Earth itself, there are a vast range of species from people, remember I'm from Chicago, from people with, uh, with a vast range of athletic and creative and intellectual abilities to the most primitive creatures on Earth. So there's a vast range of structure on Earth. When we ask the question, how did we get here, we would like to answer and account for this vast range of phenomena. So that's what we'd like to do over the next um, hour today or half hour today and, uh, and 50 minutes on Wednesday. To begin, it turns out counterintuitively, the, the simplest thing to start with is the universe at large. That turns out to be of all these things, this is actually the simplest. So let's spend a few minutes walking through why it is that, um, that, the, universe is the, simp that the universe at large is the simplest thing we can study. And to do that, we have to ask the question, what is the universe made of today? And if we want to think about how we got here, we want to ask, what was it made of in the past? So that would be the question. What's the universe made up now? And what, what was the universe made up in the distant past? 
Today we know you and I and the table and the microphone and the computers, we're all made up, uh, we're all very different, and, you know, and there's these beautiful structures and these amazing people and there's galaxies, but everything in the universe, everything in this room, everything in the universe is just basically a different combination of molecules. That's all it is. So the difference between you and me is we just have slightly different molecules configured in slightly different ways. But at the bottom, we're just all made of molecules. The difference between kebab and salad is just the molecules are arranged a little bit differently. have some different molecules in them. So there's no, the, the, at the, in the, when you get to the bottom of things, we know there's a fundamental unity to things. And in fact, it's even simpler than that. Each of those molecules is just made up of a bunch of atoms. And the atoms are particularly simple. They just have a bunch of protons and neutrons in the middle and electrons whizzing around. So at their heart, all the complexity in the universe boils down to a bunch of atoms put together in various ways. So things are complicated today. I mean, think of the, the relationships you have. Or I'll think about the relationships I have. It's very complicated, right? People, dealing with people is very, very hard. Building computers is very, very hard. But, um, but, but in the, in the, at the, in the end of the day, really, we're all made up of, of the same things. So we want to ask ourselves, all this complication that is today, was that present early on? As you go back in time, how complicated were things? Were there, were there tables? Were there people? Were there planets? Were there stars? As you go back in time, how far back can you go, and do you still have those things? So that's the question we want to ask. There's a trick we can use to answer that question. And the trick has to do with that same fact that light travels at a finite speed. So outside, the sun is shining, but you actually don't know if the sun is still there. Because the light from the sun takes eight minutes to reach us. So for all you know, so we're looking at the sun now as it was eight minutes ago. So for all you know, the sun exploded five minutes ago. And we won't know for another three minutes. Right? We're looking at the sun as it was in the past. So we can look backwards in time by looking at things that are far away. If you go further out, the nearest star, the light from that star takes four years to reach us. There might be some of you in this room, are there any of you in this room, who have siblings younger than four years old, brothers or sisters younger than four years old? Anyone here? Grandchild. Anyone with a grandchild less than four years old? Okay. That grandchild was not born when the light that we see today from the nearest star was emitted. So we see the star as it was today before your grandchild was born. And it goes on and on. As we look to the center of the galaxy, look, go out into a, into a place away from the city, and I've come to realize that Istanbul is probably not the best place to do this because it's quite crowded. I don't know if you've noticed. But, um, but um, if you go to a faraway place where there's not too many lights, and, uh, and you can see the Milky Way, the center of our galaxy. The light from the Milky Way takes 25,000 years to reach us. So the light that we see today was emitted long before there was an Istanbul or Constantinople or any other civilized city. And we can go even further away. The most distant galaxies we see, their light was emitted billions of years ago. So we are literally looking at the universe as it was billions of years ago. That's our trick. So we're going to use that trick to try to understand what the universe was like long ago. Any questions about that? You just want to see more Chicago basketball players. Don't worry, it's coming. OK, so um, here's one thing we've learned about, uh, about the universe. The universe is expanding. And what that means is that every galaxy is moving away from every other galaxy. Space itself is stretching. So let's do a little thought experiment while you try to figure out who that Chicago basketball player is. Um, imagine that this room, like the universe, doubles in size, say, in an hour. 
So after an hour of this lecture, the room will have, the space in this room will have expanded, so it doubled in size. How would we know? Well, the people in the front row are sitting about two meters or three meters away from me. So at the end of that hour, you'll be, we'll be six meters away from each other if the room doubled, right? So we'll be, the distance between us will have increased. That means that I'll see you as moving away from me, and you'll see me as moving away from you. What speed will we see each other moving away from each other? In an hour, the distance between us has increased by three meters. So what's the speed which we'll see each other moving away? Three meters an hour. That, that's how fast we'll see each other moving away. The people who've chosen to sit far in the back I'm not good with meters because I'm a feet guy, but uh, I'm guessing 50 meters or less, 30 meters, 20 meters, no, 30 meters. You're 30 meters away from me now. At the end of this hour, as the room doubles in size, you'll be 60 meters away from me. So we'll see each other moving away from each other at a speed of 30 meters an hour. So if this room really were expanding, I and everybody in the room would see everybody else moving away from them. And there will be a, a pattern. The things closest to me will be moving away with the smallest speeds, and the thing furthest away would be moving away with the largest speeds. Does that make sense? That's what this basketball player from the University of Chicago, who in 1909 scored the unimaginable total of six points one time in a basketball game, that's what he discovered in 1929. He plotted the velocities, the speeds of galaxies as a function of how far away they are from us. And he found a pattern. All the, almost all the galaxies are moving away from us, and the ones that are furthest away are moving the fastest. So this is evidence, and this is the, the first discovery over 80 years ago of this evidence for an expanding universe. In fact, there have been hundreds of follow-up observations that confirm this out to larger and larger and larger distances. So beyond a doubt, we now know that the universe is expanding. That's a clue for us. We're trying to figure out what happened in the past. We know the universe is expanding. The room is getting bigger. So let's imagine, let's do a thought experiment and go backwards into the past. The room is crunching, crunching us in together. We're all locked here in the room until 9.50. And we're all crunched together. So the room is getting very dense. And we're moving around, and we're starting to move around the atoms and molecules and people in the room are starting to move around faster. So in the early universe, was much denser and hotter. What that means is the, peop the things in it, the in this case the people, had a lot more energy. Things were heated up in the early universe. So that's a clue. The universe is expanding, and that means early on, there was a lot more energy available for the individual things in the universe to maneuver. So energy is something that physicists um, use a lot to explain things. So I have to take a little bit of a detour to explain to you how physicists think about energy. It turns out we think about it just like a well. The things that have the lowest energy are at the bottom of a well. That's the way we think about it as a metaphor. And in fact, the things that the furthest depths of the well are the most complicated things. And the energy of a complex thing is less than the energy of its parts. So there's a dog at the bottom of a well. A couple years ago, there's a dog trapped there. And they, they had to pull him out. In order to pull that dog out, they had to expend energy. right? So to bring something out of a well, you have to give it energy. Similarly, in order to Turn something, turn something into a, from a complicated thing into a simple thing, you have to give it energy. If I wanted to turn this laptop into a bunch of atoms, I'd have to smash it with a lot of energy. Right? So what, what that means is the complex things have the least energy, and, this, and to get from a complex thing to a simple thing, you need to inject a lot of energy. Does that make sense? Here's a simple example, and this really is the way physicists think about the simplest atom, the hydrogen atom, 
which has a proton and an electron orbiting a proton. We think of that hydrogen atom as sitting at the bottom of a well because it has fairly low energy compared to a free electron and a free proton. So to break up a hydrogen atom into a free electron and a free proton requires energy. You need a lot more energy. So any questions about that? That's, that's just the way physicists think about energy. And actually, like in most things, physicists were, were right. So you can trust us on this. So any questions about that? OK, so let's come back to our question. What was the universe like when it was very young? We have a clue. We know that it was much hotter, a lot more energy. And we now know what energy means. Energy is the, the, the more energetic something is, the simpler it is. So go back in time. What that means is the universe got simpler. Higher energies broke up all the complicated things. And the only things left in the early universe were the simplest elements of, of the universe. In fact, if you went far enough back in time, all there would be were these free protons and free electrons. That's all it would be. All the complications of the, the molecules, you wouldn't have to memorize any molecules. You wouldn't have to know any periodic table, any elements whatsoever. All you'd have to know is there are protons and electrons. Very, very, very simple. That is at very, very early times. That's all there was, was protons and electrons. As the universe expanded, it cooled down, right? That's what we're saying, is it? Crunched up, it was hot. As it expanded, it started to cool. So there was a transition, a period before which the universe was ultimately simple. There were only electrons and protons. And after which, the electrons and protons combined to form neutral hydrogen. That time, we can actually calculate it because we know the energies involved. We can calculate very precisely the time at which that happened. It turns out to be, again, don't remember this, but remember that there was such a time. 380,000 years, when the universe was 380,000 years old, that's when this happened. That all the electrons and protons combined to form neutral hydrogen. That time, people divide the, you know, the, the universe into different times, depending on where you're coming from. You know, in the U.S., it's 1776. Here is it, am I right in saying it's 1453? Is that the big year that you divide time? Uh, that's not where I, th I divide things when the universe is 380,000 years old. That, that, to me, divides two times. Before then, things were very, very simple. After that, all the complications began. We can actually get a glimpse of what the universe looked like at that time by using the following trick. The, the carriers of light, photons, at that very simple time when there were only electrons and protons, if I was a light particle, I wouldn't travel very far before hitting an electron or hitting a proton. So I'd be bouncing back and forth. Because photons can bounce off of charged electrons and charged protons. But once the situation changed, once the electrons and protons combined to form that neutral element, hydrogen, the photons completely stopped interacting. They did not talk to the neutral hydrogen. So after that time, they just traveled freely. So think about that. After the universe was three, since the universe was 380,000 years old, now it's about 13.7 billion years old. After this very early time, light traveled freely through the universe. What does that mean? Think about it for a minute. What does it mean that light is traveling freely through the universe? So I'll show you another picture of another Chicago basketball player. <laughs> you know who this is? Very close. Very good. Okay, good. You knew that more than you knew how many galaxies were in the universe. Okay. <laughs> so um, when we take a picture of someone, of Derek Rose, what does that mean, a picture? It means the light is bouncing off of him and hitting our camera. Right? That's what a picture is. It's traveling freely from the object to the camera without hitting anything in between. If I stood there in between him and the camera, we wouldn't get a picture of Derek Rose. We'd get a, a much more, less interesting picture. So, um, so the fact that we can take a picture means the light rays travel freely from the, from the object we're take, trying to take a picture of to the camera. In the exact same way, 
we can exploit the fact that photons are traveling freely through the universe. We're here. The photons from that very early time, from very long ago, from very far away, since that time have traveled freely. Light has traveled freely through the universe. So when we capture that light, we're taking a picture of the universe as it was when it was only 380,000 years old. When it 13.6 billion years ago. Has anyone ever been to California? In California, there are these very large trees, redwood trees. Have you heard of those? Very, the, I think they're sequoia trees. I think they're the largest trees on Earth, I think. Um, for some reason in my mind, I have it in my head that sequoia trees are the oldest things. It's completely wrong, so don't listen to anything I said. Sequoia trees are not the oldest things on Earth. They're not the oldest things we've seen. This is the oldest thing we've ever seen. The, the radiation that we see, the light we see, from when the universe is 380,000 years old, is by far, at least until six weeks ago, the oldest thing we've ever seen. So this is, remember what we're after here, we're not after cool pictures, what we're after is answering and posing a question, how did the universe, how, how did we get here? What was the universe, what did the universe look, what, what did the universe look like back then, and what does it look like today, and how did it evolve from one epoch to another? So I'm going to show you what that picture looks like, but, um, but, but I just have to first orient you. So remember, we're looking in the sky, right? So the night sky, we can look everywhere on a sky. So that's kind of like looking, you can look anywhere on a globe. Imagine you're sitting in the center of the globe. You can look anywhere on a globe. It's a little bit hard to project that onto a 2D surface, but people have been working for about 1,000 years to do that. And so a lot of times it's easier instead of, you know, this doesn't really convey the 3D thing, right? So um, they project it onto a 2D um, map. That's, that's called map, ma map making. It's projecting the three-dimensional globe onto a two-dimensional map. In order to show you what the universe looked like when it was 380,000 years old, that's, the, that's what I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you, when we look in all different directions, what the, what the universe looked like. And it's going to stun you what it looked like. Ready? This is the picture. It's called the Cosmic Microwave Background and it's compl almost completely uniform. The intensity of light coming in that direction is almost exactly the same as the intensity of light coming from that direction. No matter which way you look, it's the same there as it is there. And what that means is the conditions over there were exactly the same as they were over there. And that's what should stun you and give you a hint that the early universe was very simple. It was simple, as we've said, because unlike today, there were no large galaxies, there were no stars, there were no planets, there were no people, there were no tables, there were no molecules, there, were no, there, all the, there weren't even atoms, there were just electrons and protons. So in that sense, the early universe was very, very simple. But it was also simple because it was so uniform. Today, in, in my hand, there are many, many atoms. Does anyone know how many atoms there are in my hand? How many? Exactly. So in my hand, there are many, many atoms. What does it say? Billions and billions. Avogadro's number, right? That's a very big number. 10 to the 23 or something. There's a huge number of atoms in my hand. If I take the same space, the same, the same volume, and, wrap my, and put an empty box around that, that in any other place, almost any other place in the universe, there would be almost no atoms. So we're living in a really weird place. The, the, the number of atoms in this room is way bigger than almost anywhere else in the universe. And that means the universe is very, technically it's called inhomogeneous. It's not homogeneous. It's very, very clumpy. The stuff, the, 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 the amount of atoms that have clumped in this room are so much different. The conditions here are so much different than anywhere else in the universe. So today, the universe is very, very clumpy. There's lots of empty space and lots of space with a, with a 
with, or a small amount of space with lots of stuff in it. So that's what I'd call very inhomogeneous and very clumpy. But our picture, though, tells us that in the early universe, that was not true. In the early universe, the universe was very homogeneous. It was very smooth. So there are two differences between two, and both go in the way of simplicity, of what the universe looked like when it was very young. A, there was no complicated stuff, and B, it was very smooth. Those are the two differences. So now we know something about the early universe, and it allows us to sharpen our question. Our initial question, the one that we've been asking for thousands of years, is how did we get here? So now the question is, how did the universe evolve from being very, very smooth to being very, very clumpy? How did the simple electrons and protons combine to form the very complicated things in our current universe? So that, what we succeeded in doing in the first half hour or so is defining the question so we can hope to answer it. Any questions about that? It's the whole universe, no questions? <laughs> okay. Uh, you're, you're out of luck, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so we need some clues in figuring out how we got from here to here. So I'm going to do another trick. This is indeed a map of the um, intensity of that radiation. And you see that it's, you know, let's imagine, so you know what a map is. A map, you know what a map is, right? A map is a pixel, and every pixel has a number associated with it, right? So in this case, all the, every single, every single number, let's say it was one, uh, every single pixel seems to have the same number, let's say one, and we assign the color green to that number, right? That, that's what a map is. And every pixel seems to have exactly the same number, one. It turns out that not every pixel has exactly that number. So what I'm going to do in the next map is subtract off the one, right? And that will show that each pixel differs very slightly from every other pixel. That's what this is. It's the same map. All I've done is subtract off the average. And so we have to be a little careful when we look at this picture. The universe, this is still a picture of the universe when it was only 380,000 years old. It was still very, very smooth. But this map picks up the fact that there were small inhomogeneities. The red spot here had about one part in 10,000 more, more stuff than the blue spots. So if there were 10,000 protons here, there were 9,999 9 protons there. So there were small inhomogeneities. Does that make sense? So it turns out that in order to analyze this, um, we're going to steal, steal a, a tool that's used by musicians. Any musicians here? Great. OK, so maybe you can help. And I claim that something that you can do to analyze um, a pattern like that is to take a spectrum of it. Have you ever done that with music? Have you ever used any audio equipment to take spectrum of stuff? Anyone? Hey, we're about to do that right now. And so let me explain why I think the spectrum of this picture should be similar to the spectrum of, uh, of a musical instrument, of a musical note. And the reason is the following. Iman think, let's go back to the early universe. Imagine you are all um, electrons and protons and photons, and you're all clumped together in a pattern. So there's an, there is an overdense region over here. There's more stuff over here. And there's an underdense region over here. There's fewer stuff over here. But you're all moving pretty rapidly, because you're, you're light. Light moves pretty fast. So just by, by randomly, you're going to eventually that overdense region is going gonna, is gonna to lose its overdensity. So you, the people over here are going to filter over here. And this underdense region is going to get more people, right? 
So that is what's called a restoring force. That if you get overdense, there's a, there's, there's a natural mechanism that will reduce the density, reduce the number of people there. If there's an underdensity, there's a natural mechanism that will fill it in. And that's exactly the same thing as a guitar string. When I pluck a guitar string, there's a natural mechanism that restores it back to its equilibrium point. So therefore, the physics is the same. And we expect, therefore, the spectrum to be the same. So let me play for you a note. You've done better, right? So it's not that interesting of a note. But uh, what I'd like to do now is analyze the spectrum of that note. When we analyze the spectrum of that note, I claim that that should look something like, if I can find it, that should look something like the, um, the spectrum of uh, that map. So can you see this? Those of you in the front, you should all sit in the front next time. So this is the spectrum of, the, um, of that note, that single note. There's a single, this is called the fundamental mode, having to do with the, the string oscillating about 256 times a second. And then there are what's called higher harmonics. So, and those higher harmonics turn out to be at integer multiples of the fundamental frequency. Let's go back to this, I hope. So the, um, the, the um, spectrum of a musical note, which has this restoring force, has this feature that it um, has a fundamental frequency corresponding to a note, the oscillation of a string just going like this in a simple way. And then it has the higher harmonics that has to do with more complicated fluctuations. And you probably know this, but not everybody does. The difference between the C note, or any note, on a, on a guitar and the C note on a piano is in what? What's the difference between them? Exactly. The, way, the difference is not the fundamental mode, it's they have the higher harmonics. So you can tell a piano, an expert can tell the piano, the difference between a piano and a guitar by looking at those higher harmonics. In any event, the physics is clear. When you have this restoring force, you get this pattern of a fundamental mode followed by a series of higher harmonics. And in fact, that's, this is the spectrum of that uh, cosmic microwave background, the radiation left over from the first 380,000 years old, and you see the exact same feature. So what that tells us is we have the physics right. Very early on in the early universe, there were indeed these electrons and protons and photons swimming around. There was this notion that an overdense region became underdense due to the pressure, the stuff leaking out. Underdense became overdense. There were these oscillations. They're called acoustic oscillations. So we understand quite a bit now about what the universe was like when it was 380,000 years old. And we can refine our question yet further, which is how did the universe evolve from being pretty smooth something like this, one part in about, uh, in about uh, 10 or 100,000, to being very, very, very clumpy? That's the question we want to answer. So um, I'm done now formulating the question. And we're about to start on the answer. We'll, we'll spend the next eight minutes walking through the first part of the answer. And then next time, we'll pick it up and, and, and follow it through. But any questions about the question? We've reformulated the question that people have been asking for thousands of years. How did we get here? to a pretty quantitative question. How did the universe evolve from being slightly inhomogeneous at one part in 10 to the 5 to being extremely nonlinear and clumpy today? That's the question. Any questions about that question? OK. So to answer that question, I want to give you a metaphor. It's going to be a little bit parochial, but you've already seen I'm very parochial. So um, this is a map of the United States in about uh, 230 years ago. And it, I don't know if you can see this, but this is a population map. So it, it shows how many people there were per square mile back then, a long, long time ago. 
And those of you who are familiar with the United States can kind of see traces. This is Boston. This is New York. It might be Philadelphia. So there's some of the large cities we know today. Back then, they were still over-dense regions. That is, there were slight, this is a map of the number of people. There were slightly more people in these regions than there were in the vast expanses of Virginia. So um, the number of people in New York, there, in a square mile, a square mile is about twice the size of a square kilometer, maybe a little bigger. A square mile, there were about 45 people, 50 people in the square mile, in the densest regions of New York. There probably are about, in, in Istanbul today, how many people do you, would you say there were per square kilometer? Does anyone know? There's a lot more than 45. So at that very early time, the over-densities were much, much, much smaller than they were today. And notice there's a range. There are over-densities and there are under-densities where there were no people. So this map is a little bit similar to that primordial map we saw when the universe was only 380,000 years old. Look at the map, population map of the United States today. You see those same over-dense regions in the Northeast. But now the scale is much different. There are over 50,000 people per square mile in, in New York City. There's still only about one or two people per square mile in Wyoming and Montana, very far in the, in the western regions. So there's a huge range of over densities and under densities. The United States today is very inhomogeneous, is very clumpy, just like the universe today. And it's gotten much, much more, more um, overdense over the course of the last 200 years. So a question that if you were a sociologist that you might ask is, how did the United States evolve from here to here? What were the forces, the economic forces, that led people to cluster here? What were the social forces that led people to move from here to here? What were the racial forces? What were the religious forces, the political forces that that, that com in combination led us from this primordial map to this map that we see today. So that is exactly the kind of question that we've asked ourselves about the universe. How did we evolve from the very pristine initial state to the state we're in today? The smooth universe to the clumpy universe. In order to answer this question, you have to be a great sociologist. You have to be way better than there are today, right? Because no one knows the answer to this question. But in order to answer the question that we pose, you don't have to be that smart actually at all. You only have to know one thing. The force driving the clustering of, uh, of this matter is only a single force, it's gravity. So we're used to thinking of gravity as holding us down on Earth or as keeping the planets revolving around the sun, but actually, Gravity exists between any two bodies with mass. So think about it. When the universe was 380,000 years old and the photons, the light, stopped talking to the hydrogen, then the hydrogen was just sitting there. So this overdense region over here, due to gravity, what's going to happen to it? Over time, you, and you, and you, and you, are going to get attracted onto this overdense region because gravity is going to attract you. So even if this is a small overdense region today, very early on, over the course of billions of years, people will be, not people, atoms will be attracted into these slightly overdense regions. And so you can start from a very small overdense region very, one part in 10,000. But over the course of billions of years, it will accrete more and more and more matter until indeed it evolves to be the huge structures we see today. That, that was that one sentence? If, whatever, that sentence or two is the answer. So any questions about that? What was the expansion period? That is an excellent question. And let's take the last two minutes to answer that question, and then we'll pick it up next time. The question was, how does the expansion of the universe fit in? 
And, the end, and that's a great question. So you're sitting in the front. On the one hand, those people are attractive to you because of gravity, so you want to move back, move towards them. On the other hand, the universe is expanding, so you want to move away from them. That's your question. It turns out that um, it's a balancing act. That, um, that, that what happens is the potential wells, again, think about wells, remain, um, remain uh, just as deep as they were. And, I mean, that's, sorry, that's too technical. The, um, was it a different word? If there were no expansion, then that growth would be exponential. That it would happen exponentially rapidly, so that, you know what an exponential rapidly is, right? So it happened exponentially rapidly, so very, very quickly, things would just collapse into that thing. The, um, the expansion changes that behavior quantitatively. So it no longer grows exponentially rapidly, it now only grows as a power law in time. That's a quantitative answer to your excellent question, but that's, that's the answer to the question. Okay, we're gonna stop here. We'll pick it up again next time. Thank you for your attention.